Good evening, Delaware. Wow, it's so nice to see this many people from the community here for our um, penultimate Sega National Colloquium event of the year. Uh, this has been a remarkable series. I'm so glad to recognize so many faces from people who have been to many of these different events, some of our students. We have spent the semester hearing from Ohio Wesleyan alumni who are returning to campus to share their passions, their career paths, their um, successes and obstacles and stories with the community. And tonight we are delighted to welcome back Cameron Hewitt. As is my want this semester, since the point of the Sagan is for the speakers to tell us their stories, I'm skipping the introductions and letting them introduce themselves. But please join me in welcoming Cameron back home. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, yes, my name is Cameron Hewitt, Ohio Wesleyan, class of 1998. I was double major English and German studies, minor in psychology, and I've been living in Seattle for the last 20 years, almost to the day, like, it'll be next March, will be my 20th anniversary, where I work with Rick Steves, who's a well-known public television personality guidebook author. We run tours as well. And my main occupation with Rick is writing about Europe. I'm essentially a travel writer and a travel photographer. So I'm gonna talk a lot today about my journey from the Ohio Wesleyan campus and how that and landed me not only in Seattle working with Rick Steves, but traveling all over Europe uh, and learning about it and teaching other people about it. And if you wonder why it's so mysteriously full tonight, I will just tell you right off the bat, I'm not only an OU grad, I'm also a townie. So a lot of my fellow Delaware townies have come out to support me, which I appreciate it. Um, so it's a good, way to, a good way to stack the deck if you want a good attendance at a national colloquium <laughs> event. It's sort of like uh, what I did on my summer vacation, but this is what I did in the 20 years since I left Delaware. Um, so I do a lot of travel talks in uh, the Seattle area as part of my work about traveling in Europe, but this is a really different talk and kind of an unusual one for me because I'm usually teaching people about Europe, um, telling people uh, what to do when they get there, what to see, how to spend their time wisely. This is a different topic because this is a talk about me, which is kind of a strange feeling uh, and my journey from Ohio Wesleyan to Europe. Um, so I'm gonna, basically interweave my normal sort of travel talk approach with some uh, specific information about how I got to be where I am today. And I hope you enjoy it. It'll be a little bit of vicarious travel and hopefully, especially for current students, maybe a little inspiration about how Ohio Wesleyan can prepare you extremely well for a really rewarding and interesting career. And I'm gonna start by talking about, just to get the juices flowing and to get people in a traveling spirit, I'm gonna talk uh, first about three very different places I've traveled to in the last year uh, for my work. Um, just to kind of capture your imagination, give you a sense of the things that I do, starting in a sort of unexpected place, and that is Chernobyl. Um, about a year ago, I traveled to Ukraine, and believe it or not, it's a very popular day trip from the capital of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine Kiev, is to go to Chernobyl, which is the site of the worst accident in humankind's short history of splitting the atom. Um, it's an incredibly powerful place to go and visit. Uh, you have to go with a tour and with a guide. And with our guide, we wandered around the ghost city of Pripyat. This was a city of about 50,000 people. It was a planned workers' town, of course, during the Soviet Union. Um, it was actually a really excellent place to live. This was a very desirable part of the Soviet Union to live in, and the Chernobyl power plant was the crown jewel in Soviet technological achievement. Uh, it was considered one of their finest facilities, and this was one of the most plum jobs you could have. Um, as you probably know, uh, in the spring of 1986, Chernobyl melted down, just about two or three miles from this town of Pripyat. For the first 36 hours, there was a lot of obfuscation and a lot of, oh no, it's not really a problem, don't worry about it. Someone, uh, the guy told me a very chilling story, there was actually a wedding going on in the town hotel as the uh, power plant was melting down and everyone said, don't worry about it, it's just an interesting light show, and then go back to your lives. Finally, 36 hours later, they acknowledged this was a big problem and in a matter of hours, they evacuated all 50,000 men, women, and children from Pripyat. And so it really feels trapped in time. When you walk around Pripyat today, you can get a sense it used to be a very beautiful, thriving place. You can also see apartments where people, you can imagine, just had to rip up everything that they could carry and go jump on a bus and be removed from this exclusion zone. Um, very poignant, stepping into the lobby and seeing all the names of the people who used to live in that building and which apartment they lived in. It's just really trapped in time. Uh, it's a very powerful experience. Now you may be thinking, what are you, crazy going to Chernobyl? This was a... Uh, a hard sell for my friends and, and family when I told them I was going. Um, but thanks partly to the, oh, by the way, there's a, a, a Ferris wheel too, it's sort of the icon of Pripyat. There was a, a, 
uh, amusement park that was just about to open when the, church, when the meltdown happened. Um, and so that uh, Ferris wheel that you might see as part of this never actually operated as a Ferris wheel, but now it's sort of the sickening symbol of what happened there. Um, because I went to Ohio Wesleyan and I had a great multidisciplinary education, I understand and respect science. And so I did a lot of scientific homework before I agreed to go here. And I actually carried a radiation meter with me at all times. If you're with a guide and they know where to take you, radiation levels are perfectly safe for a one-day visit. I'm standing right here in front of the sarcophagus, which is this giant steel container that they built over the uh, a second container that they built recently, over the first container that contains the meltdown site. And you can see the radiation about 0.77 microsieverts per second, which is not that much worse than just walking down the street in any modern city. Um, however, one interesting thing about going to Chernobyl is that your guide will take, take you along a sidewalk and they'll say, stop, now hold your radiation meter over this tree and suddenly it'll skyrocket and you realize the way that radiation works is very localized. Um, the thing about Chernobyl is a lot of people go there uh, um, sort of to rubberneck at human tragedy. But I found it really an uplifting place to go because the whole story of Chernobyl is that after that initial fumbling of the situation, the Soviet Union threw all sorts of resources into containing the radiation. It could have been a lot worse. It could have affected all of Europe. Um, and so I left Chernobyl feeling really uplifted about uh, humanity's ability to overcome challenges. Uh, really vivid memory. All right, flash forward a few months. Just a couple of months ago, uh, early September, I was in Iceland. And I was assigned to go out and add a couple of new chapters to our best-selling Iceland guidebook. We're coming out in our second edition soon. Uh, and so I had a wonderful road trip lasting about a week. And I took a ferry up to the West Fjords where I was on unpaved gravel roads for much of the time. I would drive hours and hours on roads like these. You drive for a couple of hours and you pull off at the side of a road where there's a stunning waterfall. And then you hike up a path to the very head of the waterfall. And this is just commonplace in Iceland. These, these gorgeous waterfalls are everywhere. The most powerful moment I think I had in uh, this part of Iceland was when I went to a place called Latrabjarg. I parked my car and I started up this muddy, rutted trail uh, on the top of a cliff. And at first I thought, why did I drive two hours on unpaved roads to get here? But then when I looked back, I realized I was standing at the start of a seven mile stretch of cliffs that are as tall as the Empire State Building, um, facing the open Atlantic. It's actually the westernmost point in Europe. And it's an incredibly treacherous place. When I was thinking of going here, I asked the local tourist office, well, can you take a boat trip around the bottom of the cliffs? And she just laughed at me. She said, you can't take a boat at the bottom of the cliffs. This is one of my favorite little stories you pick up when you travel. Um, apparently in 1947, a British fishing trawler wrecked at the base of these cliffs. And fortunately, there were some villagers nearby and they used pulleys and ropes to go down and rescue all of the British sailors or most of the British sailors and it was all okay. A couple of years later, someone decided to make a documentary about this event, and they asked the original rescuers to go and reenact the rescue. Um, while the rescuers were reenacting the rescue, another British fishing trawler crashed at the base of the cliffs. And fortunately, all of these people were just right there with the equipment, so they ran over and saved the other fishermen too. <laughs> I love those little side stories. They seem like side stories, but that's what you remember. Um, it's also one of the best bird habitats, seabird habitats in the world. In the summertime, a million birds call this cliff home. Uh, the stench of bird shit is overpowering. <laughs> and the grass is littered with like little feathers like flower petals after a wedding. It's a really evocative scene. And if you're lucky, you might actually see a puffin. And watching these puffins come and go, I started thinking of the uh, uh, animal behavior course I took with Dr. Radabaugh here at Ohio Wesleyan. I was almost a zoology minor. I took a lot of zoology courses. And it was fascinating if you've ever watched a puffin bird try to take flight. They have these little stubby wings, so they can't just lift off. They have to throw themselves over the cliff and beat their wings like crazy to get going. And it's even funnier when they come in for a landing because they have to beat those wings like crazy and ride the current up and hope that they can break and slow themselves down just in time to land on the grassy bank. And sometimes they don't get the first time, so you watch them go around and around trying to get the right currents to do it. Uh, really a powerful experience off in the middle of nowhere at the edge of the world in Iceland. Uh, about two weeks later, I was in the Swiss Alps, and I decided to go for a hike because I had a gorgeous day. Uh, this was the Lauterbrunnen Valley, uh, which is in the Berner Oberland, um, beautiful mountainous region in the center of Switzerland. I was walking across this gorgeous mountain meadow and then suddenly a silent cable car went over my head and it was just packed to the gills with about 100 people who'd paid 100 bucks a piece to ride to the top of a James Bond themed revolving restaurant over my head. 
And I'd been there that morning, and I knew it was a nice view, but it wasn't worth 100 bucks, and I was really glad to be where I was. I had this meadow entirely to myself, uh, so I decided to go for a hike, and I was, this was literally the only other people I saw on this three-hour hike. <clears throat> I rounded the bend, and I came across a mountain pasture, uh, which is called an alp. That's where the word alps come from. Um, the alps are these high mountain pastures, and every summer, the Swiss cow farmers bring all of their cows up to the pasture to graze, and people live with them and take care of them and milk them. And then in the fall, they all parade back down into the villages down below. Uh, this was mid to late September, so I was wondering if there were actually any cows out. But then I came across a little uh, settlement of shepherds, uh, of, of cow herders, and I saw that those ceremonial bells that the cows wear up and down to pasture were hanging from the eaves, so I knew that the cows were in. And I got very excited. Well, little did I know that just a few steps down that path, suddenly I found myself immersed in a whole pack of cows that was being brought back to the barn that night, being led by a couple of modern-day, latter-day Swiss uh, cow herders. And it was a little scary at first, but I just stood still as these cows went all the way around me, behind me and up to the barn. One of those magical moments you just can't plan for. From there, I hiked downhill, and I followed a twisty path down to the adorable little village of Gimmelwald. This is a, an alpine village that Rick Steves has written about for many years. And it's just a spectacularly beautiful, humble, little rustic community. Um, rustic little houses with million dollar views, big piles of firewood out front of the houses waiting to be stacked. And suddenly, without even realizing it, I found myself walking right up past the Gimmelwald Mountain Youth Hostel, which is where I stayed the first time I was in Gimmelwald 20 years ago as a newly minted <laughs> Ohio Wesleyan graduate. I was just about a year out of school at this point. Uh, and especially knowing I was doing this talk soon, I got very nostalgic thinking about the journey that took me from there to today. Um, so that's what I want to talk to you about today, how I got from being a backpacker in college to getting to experience the things I just described on a regular basis. Um, I work for Rick Steves Europe. I'm always curious because uh, it's a little hit or miss. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Rick Steves. Yeah, that's about right. Usually about half, maybe two thirds of people. Um, it's a, it's, first of all, Rick Steves is the name of the company. It's also the name of our CEO and founder. He's one of the most respected authorities on European travel in the US, uh, based, based in Seattle, Washington. Um, I've been working with Rick for 20 years. People know him for different reasons. Uh, we are the publishers of the best-selling guidebook series in the United States and North America. Um, this is most of the work that I do is working on our guidebooks. Um, just a couple of years ago, we surpassed Lonely Planet in terms of being the best-selling series, which we felt was a big accomplishment because Lonely Planet covers the whole world, and we cover only Europe. Uh, we really specialize in Europe. Um, if you count all of the different titles we sell in a given year and you round up a little bit, it's about a million books a year, so that's a pretty healthy, uh, healthy sales. People also know Rick from his public television show, which airs locally on Channel 34 on PBS and also nationwide. Uh, this is how I first got to know Rick, watching Rick on TV every night at dinner time. He also has a national public radio show. Dr. Hipsky just told me that's how he knows Rick, also nationally uh, available to stations throughout the US. Uh, we also have a tour program, so we take about 30,000 Americans to, Euro to, to Europe every year on uh, guided bus tours. Uh, with about 40, 45 different itineraries all over the, all over the European continent. Um, it's a great place to work, and Rick is a great person to work for, and it's been really interesting being here for 20 years to see Rick's uh, celebrity increase and the importance of the work that we do increase. Rick was featured this spring uh, as a cover story in the New York Times Magazine. It had a lengthy uh, profile about Rick and about the work that we all do. Uh, and it's really fun having a front row, row seat to all of that work. Uh, but no matter how successful we become or how many guidebooks we sell, we always remember our mission, and I think that's the secret to our success. Our, our commitment is always to helping Americans, especially Americans, have good trips to Europe. We want people to have fun, culturally broadening, affordable trips to Europe. Uh, we talk a lot about how we are teachers first. We are travel teachers above all, and that's our main mission. Um, introducing Americans to Europe in a culturally sensitive way, we teach people to be temporary Europeans to try to really understand Europe uh, on its own terms, not to come in with expectations to find cliches and so forth. Um, and I'm very proud to work for a company that feels that way. We just had a leadership retreat uh, a week ago where sort of the 10 upper leadership um, managers of our company met to do an annual huddle. And behind closed doors, this is not a sales marketing point, Behind closed doors, Rick reminded us that our goal is not selling more tours and it's not selling more guidebooks. The indicator of our success is gross travel happiness created. We really believe in helping people have great trips to Europe. 
And uh, that shouldn't be a recipe for great financial success, but it is. And I think what we've stumbled upon is if you produce excellent, top quality travel content and you put it in the hands of travelers and they can see how it changes the experience that they have in Europe, you're going to succeed financially whether you try to or not. Um, so we're very fortunate to have that kind of vision and, and those kind of customers. In terms of what I do with Rick, uh, I started out as a <clears throat> I'll tell you a little more later, but I started out as a guidebook editor, um, and over the years, he and I have a great rapport. We work closely together, collaborating on writing projects, editorial projects. If he writes a book that uh, he knows needs a little bit of help, he trusts me to work on it for him and take it over the finish line while respecting his intentions and his voice. Um, and we have a really good working relationship that way, and it's been that way for about 20 years. For example, if he writes an op-ed, this just hit my desk last week, uh, he sent me an email out of the blue, hey, I'm writing an editorial that's going to be published in the USA today, would you mind taking a look? And I'll spend, you know, 15 minutes of my day reading over what Rick wrote and making some tweaks and sending it back, and it's really fun to work for a company that lets you do that sort of thing. Uh, and if Rick wants to do a guidebook chapter on St. Petersburg, he knows that he can trust me to go to St. Petersburg and research it and write it in the same way, in the same spirit that he would do it. I think actually a lot about uh, the, uh, the English department here at Ohio Wesleyan when I do projects like this. And uh, specifically in freshman year, I had a class with Dr. Joe Musser. I don't think Dr. Musser's here. Uh, but I remember one of the things that he had us do every week that was extremely tedious was that we had to write an imitation of another writer that we admired. And it just didn't make sense to me. I just was like, I don't want to write like somebody else. I want to write like myself. You're supposed to teach me how to write like myself. But I went through and did it. And here it turns out that my whole career is writing like somebody else, exactly like <laughs> Joe Master taught me to do. And what's nice about Rick and I is I think we, part of the reason we hit it off right away is we have similar philosophy, similar approaches, similar writing styles. So I would actually say, my writing style has gravitated more towards his, but his has also kind of gravitated more towards mine, and we've together kind of formed, a, a, with some other great collaborators, a company voice that is sort of consistent and people recognize as Rick Steves. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about the journey that took me from Ohio Wesleyan to there, and this is a bit of a cliche, I apologize, but it occurred to me that uh, a person's career is like a trip, planning for a trip. Uh, I do a lot of trip planning in my, my line of business, uh, especially for my parents' friends who who look me up and say, hey, I'm going to Italy, give me some tips. And I love to do it. It actually is one of my, my uh, pure enjoyment things that I, that I get out of my trip. But what I find is people who try to structure everything perfectly and plan out hour by hour exactly what they want to do, they're going to end up stressed, they're going to end up disappointed, and they're going to end up not getting to do all the things they wanted to, and they're going to feel like that was kind of an unfortunate choice. The people who are super loosey-goosey, who don't want to make any reservations or plan anything, have the opposite problem. They end up missing out on things that they would have been able to do if they'd done a little bit more homework and a little more planning. Uh, and I find for my own trips, the best strategy is the middle strategy. You want to have a framework for your journey, but you don't want to get too wedded to it, and you want to be able to flex with serendipities as things come and go. Um, that's the way I plan a trip, and when I look back on my journey from Ohio Wesleyan to Seattle, that's very much exactly how it happened. You just have to be, know where you want to go roughly, but be willing to be flexible and roll with whatever happens. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm not just a product of Ohio Wesleyan University, I'm a product of Delaware, Ohio. I grew up here, uh, spent 20 years of my life here, and I gotta say this was a fantastic community to grow up in. I, I thank the lucky stars every day, and think every day about how all the things that I learned in this amazing community made me the person I am today. And by the way, that doesn't mean that it's exclusive of Ohio Wesleyan. I'm thinking of people uh, that were very important in my life who actually were Ohio Wesleyan graduates. So I just wanna say, if you graduated from Ohio Wesleyan and have lived a significant part of your life in Delaware, raise your hand. There you go. These are some amazing people who, after they've left Ohio Wesleyan, have become a fabric of this incredible community. Um, so I grew up here, um, went to Olentangy High School, graduated from there just up the road in Powell <coughs> in 1994. And when I looked around at universities, I decided to go to Ohio Wesleyan University. My sister had gone here. She was class of 93. Um, it was nearby. I got a great scholarship here. It had a great uh, academic program. Several of my friends coincidentally ended up coming here as well, uh, and it ended up being a great decision. In fact, my wife, my now wife, then girlfriend also ended up going here. She's here today, Shauna. We were actually high school sweethearts at Olentangy, and we actually were determined not to go to the same high school, the last, or college. The last thing we wanted was to be the sort of the, uh, the stereotypical high school sweethearts to go to college together. We both looked at a lot of other schools, but we, all, uh, we both of us ended up back here at Ohio Wesleyan, which also turned out for the best, obviously, too. Um, so while I was at Ohio Wesleyan, as I mentioned, I was an English major. 
Um, I ended up being a German studies major. I had come in having uh, studied Spanish extensively, so I already was fairly fluent in Spanish when I arrived here. And so I walked in on day one to my introductory German class. I wanted to learn a new language. I spoke not a word of German. I had two professors. The German department at that point was two professors, Dr. Volber and Dr. Kremling. I don't think either of them are here. Um, ah, Dr. Volber, how are you? How Volba? Wie geht's? Every, uh, every word of German I learned was from Dr. Volber and Dr. Kremling. Um, and I found myself a year after graduation using German extensively for my job. Um, so that was a, a, another important part of my career here. I was also a psychology minor, but you know, it's great uh, being at a liberal arts school because I, like I said, I took, I think, three or four zoology courses. I thought about minoring in zoology, philosophy, anthropology, humanities. Um, I got a really wide exposure. And when you're doing that, when you're in your education, you don't think about exactly how it's going to apply to your career. But I have to say, I've used so many things that I never would have expected in unexpected ways in my career. And as I go through, I'm going to talk about other examples as well. Uh, but it was a great place to go to college. When it came time to do a semester abroad, I knew I wanted to do a semester abroad. I kind of wanted to do a, a semester in Germany because I was a German major. But uh, Ohio Wesleyan had this fantastic uh, program um, in Salamanca, which was set up by Dr. Kent, who's here today. Um, and I decided uh, I should go to Salamanca instead, go back to sort of take a sabbatical from my German studies and go back to Spanish for a semester. Uh, it turned out to be an amazing experience, fall of 1996. Uh, Dr. Kent just reminded, Brian reminded me. Salamanca, if you don't know, is a beautiful city in the central western part of Spain. It's famous for a couple of things. It has one of the most beautiful squares in all of Spain. <clears throat> it's also home to one of the country's most prestigious universities. I think it's the third oldest continually operating university in the world, something like that. And Dr. Kent set up an excellent program where we actually studied at this historic university with full faculty members and had amazing classes uh, and really exposed us to Spanish language and literature and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> we also lived with host families, so I had a great chance to get to know a local Spanish family. Exposed to all sorts of new culinary experiences and Dr. Kent set up some wonderful field trips around Spain. So we would go to the beaches of Galicia in the northwest of Spain, uh, the hill towns of the Pyrenees, Barcelona, the first, I was thinking, the first time I ever rode a subway was in Barcelona on a, on a, a group visit with, uh, with Dr. Kent. Um, I returned from my semester abroad and got my degree at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, I was, uh, again, double major. I was valedictorian, summa cum laude. It would have seemed on paper like I had the world by the tail and like the future was all mine to go out and grab it. And the day after graduation, I woke up and I realized I have no idea what I want to do with myself. I know I really loved my college career, but I hadn't really been thinking about how it would apply to the real world. And so this begins a period of about a year and a half that I think of as the wilderness years, <laughs> where I just really had no concept what I was going to do with myself. I was living with my parents. This is nothing to be ashamed of. This is going to happen probably to a lot of you students for a little while. Living with my parents, not sure what to do. I had family on the Pacific Northwest, so I drove all the way out to the Oregon coast, and I got there and I said, I don't know what to do here either. So a couple months later, I drove back, and then I thought I maybe wanted to be a teacher, so I was a substitute teacher, and I just was at wit's end. And when you don't know what else to do, what do you do? You go on a trip. I said, I think I'll, I think I'll escape all of this and go to a backpacking trip to Europe. And it so happened that around that time, my parents were obsessed with watching Rick Steves every night on public television, Channel 34. One episode at 7, another episode at 7.30. We'd watch back-to-back -back shows every night. And my mom said, you know, I think that Rick Steves has some travel guidebooks. So my wife, Shauna, was going, then girlfriend, now wife, Shauna, was going with me for the beginning of the trip to Great Britain. And I said, we were talking about, we just didn't know where to begin, how to plan this itinerary. And I said, you know, my mom says this Rick Steves guy has guidebooks. Maybe you should pick up one of those. Um, and then two days later, she called me. She said, I got the Rick Steves book out of the library. I know what we're doing now. It's fantastic. It tells us exactly what we need to know. And sure enough, it did. We had an amazing trip using Rick's book for a couple weeks. And then she went home, and I continued on uh, exploring around Europe. By the way, calling it the wilderness years also had to do with the unfortunate facial hair that I grew. <laughs> Again, you'll, everyone goes through that phase, I think. <laughs> I had a great trip, and you know, early in the trip, what, came an what turned out to be an extraordinarily formative event, also with fellow Ohio Wesleyan grads. This is uh, Trevor Holmes, fellow class of 1998. His sister Abby was still a student at that time. After graduation, Trevor had been accepted to the Peace Corps. He was stationed in Slovakia. I was in England at this part of my trip. And Trevor said, hey, my sister Abby is coming over and we're going to travel around Eastern Europe. If you'd like to come, why don't you come meet up with us and we'll go around. And I said, OK, I, I never would have thought of going to Eastern Europe, but why not? 
And I remember there was this epic connection. I had a rail pass and I was in South England. So I took a ferry to France, a train to Paris, a night train to Munich, a day train to Berlin, a night train from Berlin to Krakow, Poland. Uh, an epic two-day journey using my, the absolute most of my rail pass. And when uh, Trevor and I were making plans, I said, well, where should we meet? When should we meet? He said, well, you're getting in Tuesday morning. So Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock, let's meet on the main square of Krakow. And I said, does Krakow have a main square? And he said, yeah, it probably has a main square. <laughs> so I got off the train early in the morning, and I was stumbling through the semi-dark. And sure enough, Krakow doesn't just have a main square. It has one of the nicest main squares in Europe. Um, and I sat on a bench for about a half hour and waited. And stroke of nine, Trevor comes around the corner. And it worked, and I, I had a couple of revelations. One of them was, this is a fun thing to do, like to travel around and to tackle challenges and to make these things happen. And the other thing was, man, I really love Eastern Europe. So we spent some time in Krakow, we went to Prague, um, we went to Budapest, lots of other places. Um, and I guess the, the message I think here is, you never know how those Ohio Wesleyan connections are gonna change your life. I never would have gone uh, to see this part of Europe if it weren't for Trevor living there in the Peace Corps. Uh, and it turned out to be revolutionary. And here's why. Uh, went home from my trip. I had a great time, by the way, on the rest of my trip. I was there for about two months. And I went home back to the wilderness years, and I was still pretty unhappy and not sure what to do with myself. But I, something was different. I had a different sense of optimism. I had a different sense of the world. And it was like I had discovered a passion I didn't know that I had. And all I knew is that I wanted to figure out a way to follow that passion, the passion being travel and this fascination I now had with Eastern Europe. So while it was still the wilderness years, it was a little bit better. It was okay. <laughs> so um, one of the things I did when I got home is I said, you know, I'm going to write that Rick Steves a letter because I thought he was just such a cool guy and I loved his books. And so I wrote Rick a long letter. First, thanks for the books. It was great. And then I thought, I'm going to say a little bit more about Eastern Europe in your guidebooks. In Rick's guidebooks, there was Prague and nothing else. And so I wrote a long letter describing some of the places I went, Krakow, Budapest, Dresden, and, Eastern, and former Eastern Germany, and sort of kind of pitched him, saying, you know, one of these days you're going to have to add these to your guidebooks. They're great places. You could feel like they're really, something's really happening here. Um, so, and then at the end, I thought, you know, why not? I'll just throw in my resume just in case. I almost didn't. <laughs> but at the end, I added a thing that said, oh, if you're looking for someone to work for you, here's my resume. Um, I went back to not having a job, and uh, my mom at one point said to me, Cameron, you got to get off the, you know, get off your butt and go look for a job. She said, it's not like Rick Steve's just going to call you up out of the blue and offer you a job. Uh, a couple days later, I was sitting at home, and the phone rang, and a very familiar voice said, hi, is this Cameron? I said, yeah. The voice said, hi, this is Rick Steve's. <laughs> I just got your letter, and it was great, and I loved it. And you're right, I love Eastern Europe, but I don't have time to do it, but you're right. And we had this fantastic conversation. Uh, we really hit it off on the phone. And then he said, hey, are you serious about coming to work for me? I said, oh, yes, I am, sir. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, we're not hiring now, but we might be hiring in a few months. And if you're ever out in the Northwest, just look me up. So I hung up the phone with Rick, and I called my grandma, who lived in Portland, Oregon. I said, Grandma, I'm coming to visit. <clears throat> Literally, that same day, I bought a ticket. <clears throat> so I went out to uh, the Pacific Northwest and saw a bunch of relatives out there. And then I decided I was going to head up to Seattle to meet Rick at one point. A couple days ahead, I thought I better call him to make sure he knows that I'm coming. So I called Rick. And I said, uh, hey, Rick, this is Cameron Hewitt. You, you like my letter? I'm going to come see you. He said, who is this? <clears throat> I said, Cameron Hewitt, we have the, you, you called me. You said you liked my letter. Um, well, I don't know who you are, but if you want to come talk to me, you can come ahead. Now, at this point, it would have been very easy for me to turn tail and run and say, forget this, this was an embarrassing mistake, I never should have done this, but having no other options, I said, I might as well go up and meet Rick. And sure enough, I drove up to Edmonds, and I went to his office, and he gave me this quizzical look when we sat down. He said, now, who are you again? And I said, I'm the guy who wrote you the letter about Eastern Europe. He said, oh, yeah, you're the guy from Iowa. I said, Ohio. He said, whatever. <laughs> Um, I like to tease him about that. So he, uh, we hit it off again in person, and it turns out they were hiring a couple of months later. Um, and so uh, suddenly I was a, a prospective employee of Rick Steves, and my wife, Sean, and I loaded up our car and drove out to Seattle, and I started work there. Um, when I first started at Rick Steves Europe, this is our headquarters in Edmonds, Washington, uh, they didn't have any openings in the guidebook department. I knew I wanted to be a guidebook writer, but there wasn't a lot of choices at that time. So I ended up working in our travel center, uh, which is sort of a retail store and a place where people can come in and get advice for their trips. 
And it turned out to be one of the best things I did. And I think that the lesson here is don't be afraid to pay your dues. If you find an organization that you're really interested in, it's worth experimenting with six months or a year of your life and see if there's anything there, even if the position that you want isn't available. Because that's exactly what I did here in the Travel Center. Not only was it, did it give me a chance to kind of establish myself so people could see what my potential was, it also gave me an op uh, excellent opportunity to familiarize myself with our content and also with our customers. I feel like I actually, to this day, understand our customers in a way that other people that I work with maybe don't because I had that two years of answering their questions on the phone and in person all day, every day. Um, also, you just got to volunteer for anything that needs to be done to prove yourself. If they need a guy to dress up like a Viking for the travel festival, I'm your guy, okay? <laughs> After two years <coughs> working in the travel center, which was a great experience, uh, finally there was an opening in the guidebook department, and so I got a job as a, a, a starting level editor in our guidebook department, and I ended up being there for 12 years, gradually gaining seniority. Around that time, I also had <coughs> um, an opportunity to do some guidebook research in Europe, which is the thing that I really dreamed of. And I gotta say, I was kinda terrified. This was my big break, this was the thing I wanted to do, and I kinda got in my head about it a little bit. Um, and it was really intimidating, and then the day came, and I took the train to Lake Geneva, to the city of Lausanne. I remember that was my first day I ever did guidebook research. And on the way there, I just thought, I don't know how I'm even going to do this. And then I remembered some very wise advice that my father-in-law always says, which is, how do you do any difficult thing? You do it like eating an elephant, one bite at a time. You just start with the first thing, and then you do the next thing, and then you do the next thing, and next thing you know, it's 20 years later, and you're back at your alma mater. Um, so that first day in Lausanne, I went to a hotel and I asked the first question that they taught me how to ask people and I wrote down the answer and then I asked them the next question and then I went to the next hotel and the next hotel. In retrospect, it was not that difficult of a task, um, but I proved to myself that I could do it and that's something that has, has sort of held true for the rest of my career. Don't be afraid to tackle a big project. You just have to break it down and do it slowly by slowly. Um, the other thing that was really cool uh, is that I found myself using my German major almost immediately after graduation. I found myself having extensive conversations in German. Granted, it was about what is the price for a double room next year at your hotel. Um, a little less esoteric than I might have imagined when I was a German studies major, but I was using my major in a way that was really uh, rewarding. And so that basically, one thing led to another. I ended up doing more and more work around Europe, and it brought me to where I am today. Um, meeting lots of interesting people, going to beautiful places. I'm also a really avid photographer, and it was uh, amazing as a travel writer, sort of a secondary benefit is I'm in beautiful places in the right place at the right time, and I've ended up taking lots of pictures, uh, probably thousands of pictures that appear in our guidebooks. All the pictures that you see, almost all the pictures you see here today, I took uh, when I was in those places. So it's also been a great way to pursue a hobby. Now, when I started at Rick Steves, as I mentioned, we didn't really have the company that had no sense of Eastern Europe. We had one chapter on Prague in our Germany guidebook, of course, uh, and that was it. Um, and I think maybe subconsciously part of why Rick responded to my letter is he knew that he, at some point he needed to get deeper into Eastern Europe. He saw that I had a writing style that was compatible with his, um, and I think at some level he knew that I might play a role in that in the future. Um, so just a few years into my job, I had the nerve to ask Rick, would you like me to co-author an uh, Eastern Europe guidebook with you? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll take a chance on this kid and we'll see how it goes. Um, and now we're in the 10th edition of that book. It was a, it was a success uh, and it's gone really well. By the way, what is co-author? Um, co-author basically means I went over and I wrote the whole book and then we put Rick's name on it so that it would sell <laughs> a few more copies. Um, I'm sort of joking, sort of not. Um, <clears throat> But the thing is, I will say about this about Rick, and it's really true, he is personally involved in everything we do, and that's, I think, rare for a company of our size and our success. He is hands-on involved. When I wrote the first Eastern Europe book, before it even was published, he went that year and followed what I did and made his own mark on it. And to this day, he's very actively involved in our content, which is, which is really impressive. Um, so we had our Eastern Europe book, now in its 10th edition. As a co-author, I'm also responsible for updating every edition. If I'm a hired gun on the Iceland book, I'll just do the first edition and someone else will do the rest. Um, but I really have a commitment to Eastern Europe. Uh, we also have a Croatia Slovenia book and a Budapest book. And we have a friend from Prague who writes our Prague guidebook as well. Um, and it's interesting, uh, I've alluded a couple of times to this passion I have for Eastern Europe that started going to meet up with an old Ohio Wesleyan friend there. Um, and it's been really a, a, an honor to help develop the Eastern Europe part of the Rick Steves Europe content. Um, I love places like Poland. This is the gorgeous historic city of Krakow in Poland, uh, Warsaw, Gdansk. Poland is a really beautiful, underrated country. Budapest is one of, and Hungary is one of my favorite cities in Europe. Um, it's a gorgeous cityscape, beautiful historic churches, 
and some amazing uh, experiences. They have a fantastic thermal bathing culture in Budapest that I enjoy taking advantage of and teaching people about. Uh, I also spend a lot of time in Croatia, going to lots of little coastal towns, big coastal towns, thriving cities. Uh, Croatia is a really fun emerging destination that's been fun to cover. My favorite country in Europe is Slovenia, part of the former Yugoslavia, a little tiny country, two million people, uh, alpine country. It kind of looks like Austria or Switzerland. Um, incredibly friendly people, interesting uh, culture. Really love Slovenia. This is Lake Bled, the small capital city of Ljubljana. The Julian Alps, some of the most beautiful mountains, I think, in Europe are in Slovenia. And then nearby, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro. I found myself writing guidebooks about places I never would have thought of visiting just a few years before. A um, few things about why I'm so passionate about Eastern Europe, just to get some insight into my, my process. You know, especially back 20 years ago when this started, when people thought of Eastern Europe, they thought of the communist period. This was just basically 11 years removed from the fall of the Iron Curtain, which is part of why we weren't really covering it in our guidebooks very much. Um, and it's been really interesting. I find that really interesting too. The, the modern day, present day history is really vivid and interesting to me. Um, but I also am really enjoy the fact that that's falling farther and farther into the memory and the dustbin of history. It's part of their history, but it's not the dominant part of their history. If you want to find these communist statues anymore, you have to go looking for them. They have them in these little theme parks out at the edge of town. Um, so it puts things in their proper context. <clears throat> I've also really enjoyed watching these countries kind of come out of their communist era cocoon. This is the Sechenyi Bath, which is one of the best uh, thermal bathing complexes in Budapest. Um, this is what it looked like around the time I was first visiting. And over the years, all of these cities have just scrubbed themselves clean. This is what it looks like today. And it's been amazing for me to have a front row seat at this year after year going back at this transformation of these places. Inside that building, you have this amazing thermal bath complex, which is another thing I love about Eastern Europe. There's experiences you can have there that you don't get other places. This great thermal bathing culture in Budapest, uh, <clears throat> hiking around the walls of Dubrovnik, the beautifully preserved historic town at the southern point of Croatia's Dalmatian coast. Uh, some amazing natural wonders in Croatia, in the interior of Croatia, these beautiful waterfalls of Plitvica Lakes National Park, the Julian Alps of Slovenia, and really the whole Croatian coastline is just breathtaking. So it's just been a really a pleasure to travel in these places over the years. I also find that these countries have a lot more variety than people would expect. Again, especially going back 20 years ago, you think, well, everything behind the former Iron Curtain is about the same. And as you travel in these places, you realize how different they are. They have different languages, different uh, cuisines different histories, different philosophies about life. Uh, one of the most stark examples of this is Bosnia-Herzegovina. This is the town of Mostar, which is just a two-hour drive from Dubrovnik, that beautiful coastal town in Croatia I just showed you. And I love going to Bosnia because it has a very strong Turkish Ottoman-influenced culture. They've got a great culture, for example, for Turkish coffee, which they call Bosnian coffee. Um, my Bosnian friends love to have me out for Bosnian coffee when I, anytime I'm in town. And I'm always quick to get a quick drink of it, like Italian style, where you just slam down the espresso so you can keep going. And they always sort of chide me. They say, no, 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 Cameron. The purpose of Bosnian coffee is not just to caffeinate. It's a social ritual. It's about slowing down. Now, this is this unfiltered, you might have had this Turkish coffee, unfiltered coffee. If you drink it too fast, you get a mouthful of grounds. They like it that way, because it forces them to slow down, so sort of take it all in, spend time talking to their friends. They don't want to be in a hurry to drink their coffee. They want to take their time. Uh, I just love these little pockets of culture that you find all over Europe. I also love the undiscovered quality of it. It still really is, some places are becoming very discovered. Prague obviously is well known. But Eastern Europe has some beautiful little areas <clears throat> that most people don't know about. This is a gorgeous town on the north coast of Poland called Gdansk. Uh, you might notice Danzig, which is the old German name before it was part of Poland. Um, this is one of my favorite towns. I think it's one of the best kept secrets in travel. It's a beautiful historic Hanseatic uh, coastal, uh, coastal trading town. And you can walk down streets like this and have the place entirely to yourself. The same street in a town in Germany would just be packed with people. I love making those discoveries. There's also a, a lot of gentility and a lot of really rich culture going on, especially now that we're 30 years removed from communism. There's a wonderful cafe culture in a lot of these places really interesting nightlife, and great restaurants. I'm, uh, one of the hats that I wear at Rick Steves is I go, go through our guidebooks and make sure that we have a good variety of restaurant listings that reflect modern evolving tastes and sort of foodie culture. And I think Budapest and Warsaw are two of the best and most underrated food cities in all of Europe. 
Um, so it's just been a real pleasure for me to, to get to know these places. And most of all, I have made great friends all over the place. A lot of these are our tour guides, um, but I connect with them anytime I'm in town. Marian and Barbara, uh, who live in Slovenia, Peter in Budapest, Tina also in Slovenia, Ben from Denver. Uh, he's a fellow American, but like me, he's just fallen head over heels for Eastern Europe. He went with me to Chernobyl, actually. Um, so it's great having all these friends. And we have a, a meeting every January where all of our tour guides fly in um, for a week of meetings in Seattle to talk about our tour program, which is a really unusual thing for a tour company. And I always, to this day, invite all of our Eastern European guides to have dinner in my house, and it's a really special celebration, and it's one of our favorite days of the year. We've got people from Bulgaria and from the Czech Republic and from Hungary and from Slovenia and Croatia all breaking bread together. It's really a cool, cool experience. <clears throat> And in addition to the guides, I just get to meet local people. These are a couple of guys who run B&Bs in Dubrovnik, and I always have breakfast with them when I'm in town. Um, I've talked a lot about Eastern Europe, but about 10, 12 years ago, um, I was ready for a change of pace, and Rick was realizing there wasn't quite enough of him to go around. <clears throat> so we decided that I would become more of a generalist, and since then I've fanned out all over Europe. Uh, mastering those skills that I started with in Eastern Europe and applying them to other countries. And over the course of that time, I've done a little inventory. I've worked on, I think, almost every chapter in every single one of our guidebooks in about 40 different countries. I've been uh, to most of the countries on this map. Uh, and I just love that aspect of my job. Whether I'm going to a place for the 10th time or for the first time, uh, it's really a pleasure. As one of our most experienced researchers, I go to the tough places, the places that need a lot of extra TLC. For example, the Cinque Terre is this beautiful stretch of the Italian Riviera, uh, and it's very popular these days, but it's also very crowded, very complicated. There's lots of local politics. Um, the guy who runs the national park is always changing things around. Um, and so if they need somebody to go in and just figure all this out, I'm the person that they send. Actually, Cinque Terre might be the only destination in all of our books that we have a really hard time getting people to go and do research for. Uh, most people would volunteer readily to do anything, but this is kind of known as a tough place. Or, for example, Sintra in Portugal. This is a beautiful little town just outside of Lisbon, and it's where there's lots of palaces, pleasure palaces of kings and of royalty. Um, but it's very complicated, and I've come to believe deeply that there are people in the tourist industry in Europe whose job it is to make uh, visiting a place as confusing as they possibly can. And I went to Sintra a few years ago, and I just had to unravel all of these different competing combination tickets. And there's a bus that runs clockwise on even days of the week and counterclockwise on odd days of the week, and it just doesn't make any sense. Believe it or not, this is another place where I think of my training at Ohio Wesleyan. Think specifically about Dr. Barrick. Dr. Barrick uh, was, uh, is a, a highly esteemed cognitive psychology researcher, and he took me on as a research assistant while I was here. And by working with Dr. Barrick, I learned how to grapple with complicated systems of data lots of information that just didn't make sense, and he helped teach me how to put it into a centrifuge so it started to sort out and make sense so that you can assemble it into something that's meaningful and helpful. So some of that critical thinking skills that I learned uh, very eagerly with Dr. Barrick, I find myself applying all the time all over Europe. It's all these little sort of things you don't think you're gonna apply necessarily when you go in a certain direction of your career and you find that you really will. Uh, one of my favorite challenges in my, in my uh, work, and I've been doing a lot of this the last 10 years or so, I've been very fortunate to be at Rick Steves at a time where we're expanding our guidebook series. Every year we want to come out with one or two new guidebook titles to make sure we're covering the full map of Europe. So for example, um, about 12 years ago, uh, we decided we wanted a Greece guidebook, and of course you want to really do a good job covering the art and history if you're going to be writing about Greece. And so this is where I think a key thing for anyone in any field to know about is it's really important to have the right collaborator. Don't think you can do it all yourself. This is Rick with Gene Openshaw, who's actually an old friend of Rick's. They went to high school together. And it just so happens that Gene Openshaw is one of the most brilliant art historians you'll ever meet and is a beautiful writer. He can take a complicated, weird uh, footnote of European history and talk about it in an eloquent way that almost is like music. He's really talented. If you've ever used Rick Steves' guidebooks, and done some of our longer museum tours, painting by painting tours. Those are almost all by Gene Openshaw. Um, you know, a lot of people never get to meet their idols. I get to work with two of my idols, uh, Rick and Gene. I feel very fortunate. So when we're doing a book on Athens, Gene tackles the heavy hitting art and history material and writes these gorgeous tours. And then I'm lucky enough to be the first person in the world who gets to take these tours. I always feel like I'm kind of like friends with the Beatles and they're playing me the demo just before they lay down the final track. Um, 
And then that leaves, frees me up to do some of the stuff I enjoy. For example, I went back to Athens just a couple years ago, and I wrote a, a self-guided walking tour of the city neighborhood, which is a really hip, happening, trendy neighborhood with lots of street food, street art, and I was able to write a, a guided tour of that sort of aspect of the Athens experience, while Jean's focusing on the art and the history. Um, I also went out to Mykonos, for example, and Santorini to write up chapters there. We've repeated this formula for a lot of our other new books in the last eight or ten years. Barcelona book, going back to where I visited with Dr. Kent on our uh, Salamanca Abroad semester. Our Berlin guidebook is another collaboration between me and Jean. Um, and that was a great fit. Uh, Berlin, for all the things that Berlin is known for, people don't realize it has some of the best art and history museums in the world, and certainly in Europe. So Jean wrote these beautiful tours of the art history museums, and I got to go and write walking tours that were more about the communist period, which is my passion, and learning about what it was like to live in East Berlin under communism. Um, and then there are other books that we've had to do over the years, um, and it's, it's always a fun challenge, for example, in Scotland, to take a guidebook. We had some guidebook material in our Great Britain book about Scotland, but we wanted a whole Scotland book. So I had the pleasure of spending a month driving around the Scottish Highlands, scouting information for this book, and putting together, you know, basically extrapolating what we already had into something that we feel like represents the whole country of Scotland. Uh, it turned out to literally be the coldest and wettest July on record in Scotland. But I didn't mind one bit. I didn't mind the wet shoes at all. I had a great time. Um, and the other thing that we tried to do, again, um, it's sort of a tricky thing. We try to teach our, our uh, travelers not just to be tourists who are dropping into town and dropping back out. We don't want to serve them cultural cliches on a, a, a platter. Whether in our guidebooks or on our tours, we really want people to have a more meaningful understanding of these things. So in Scotland, that was a little bit of a challenge, because Scotland is a, is a land of many famous cliches. Um, kilts, bagpipes, haggis, and so forth. People want to see those things, so you don't want to ignore them. But I made a point to really delve in and learn more about them and really educate our people about some of the, the reasons behind those things. One thing that Rick Steves teaches our tour guides, and he's taught me, I always hear Rick's voice in the back of my head. He says, the reader should never ask, so what? Don't just say, Scottish people have bagpipes. Well, so what? Why, why is it that this is a part of their culture? How do they, how do they play a bagpipe? You know? um, so I would go to some Highland games, not the big famous Highland games, but small town Highland games to try to understand that. I went to a place where they make kilts. I went to a workshop where they make bagpipes, and I was able to write some little deeper information, getting beyond the cliches in those places. Uh, we also are always about trying to serve travelers' needs. And if about oh, seven or eight years ago, we realized a lot of our readers were using our guidebooks on a cruise. And that's not how we intended our guidebooks to be used. We kind of pride ourselves on independent travel. But we were discovering again and again, people were telling us, I went on a cruise, I had a wonderful time, and I used your guidebook in every port. And so we decided we wanted to serve those needs better. So they sent me over the course of two years, I think on six or seven different European cruises, and it was my job to step off the ship at an industrial port and figure out, if I was here for a day, how would I get into town most affordably, most efficiently, and so forth. There's this cheap, the cheap option, the expensive option, and so forth. Um, so we, we do this stuff on the ground. That's part of what we do. Um, and then we adapted all of our guidebook material to be the perfect size for somebody who's uh, just in town for a day. Um, those books, uh, those, not only did the books become successful, but this was really interesting. Our publisher told us, after our guidebook, uh, our cruising guidebooks came out, Lonely Planet started to come out with cruising guidebooks for the first time. And he says he thinks that's the first time we often will see what Lonely Planet has and say, well, we should probably cover that area. We think it's the first time that the opposite is happening, which kind of shows the influence that we have on the market. Uh, and then the last two I'll talk about for guidebooks, uh, new guidebook material. Two really fun projects we've done recently, and these were especially challenging. About three years ago, we decided to do a brand new guidebook on Iceland, which is an extremely popular destination. And this was writing from scratch. Unlike Scotland or Berlin or Barcelona, we didn't have anything to start with. Um, so that's a pretty daunting prospect. Um, I think Rick was holding off for many years because he personally didn't have the time or the energy to devote to it. But I, I uh, <coughs> kept bringing it up, and he finally said, you know, I trust you to go and have the time and energy to do it. I don't have to be the one to do it, uh, which was a, a great honor, but also kind of frightening. Um, but we collaborated again. What I've learned over the years, you collaborate with smart people. We had a guidebook researcher who'd worked for us for years who actually had lived in Iceland. He was an American who'd lived in Iceland for 10 years, so we enlisted him, Ian Watson, to write the first pass on our Iceland material. And then I got the fun of going after Ian. And he knows Iceland, and he's a great guidebook writer, but my job is to make sure it sounds like a Rick Steves guidebook and to make sure it has those insights that our readers expect from us. Um, so I had a beautiful three weeks or so driving around Iceland and putting that on our map. Um, 
And it's, I gotta say, it's also very satisfying working for a company where you're working hard like this, and you know that the day that the guidebook comes out, it's already gonna be the best-selling guidebook in North America and Iceland, and that's exactly what happened, and it still is today. And it's, it's really satisfying when you know your work is gonna be appreciated that way. Uh, we did the same thing the next year with Sicily. Again, a place from scratch, and again, we decided to collaborate with an American and a Sicilian who together did the first pass on the material, and we ended up with a really, I think, good guidebook on Sicily. Um, <clears throat> and not to lay it on too thick, but I do think all the time when I'm traveling about the lessons learned at Ohio Wesleyan. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of that. I was just in London for one day uh, in the middle of October on my way home from Europe. And as I always do when I'm in London, I wanted to go to the Shakespeare's Globe Theater. If you, if you know the Jake Shakespeare's Globe, they literally rebuilt a thatched roof wooden replica of a theater that would be very similar to the actual theater in which Shakespeare's plays were performed uh, close to the original location. Uh, I actually went and saw Midsummer Night's Dream which was really surreal in the middle of October. It was literally freezing rain and everyone was bundled up and we're talking about summer fantasies. Um, but anytime I do that, and I've seen four or five plays at the Globe by now, I always think of Dr. Dennis Prindle's uh, Shakespeare survey course that I took in college. And you think, oh, I'm an English major, I should probably take a course on Shakespeare. I'm not sure I'll ever really need that, but it sounds like something I should do. And I gotta tell you, the rest of your life, you're gonna have an appreciation for Shakespeare that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So I can sit through a play, three hour play, and really have a context for understanding why he's presenting it in this way and how it's similar to another play that I read back then. Another example is I was in Canterbury this spring, I think it was April or May, uh, and I was walking down the street updating our guidebook, and I came across a, a relatively new statue of uh, Chaucer, who's the author of Canterbury Tales, one of the most important works of Middle English literature. And right there, he's holding a scroll with the first lines of the Canterbury Tales in the original Middle English. And I thought back, I had a history of the English language course with Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Bland, and she made us memorize the opening lines to Canterbury Tales. Did anyone else have to memorize the opening? Yeah, Hipsky, yep. Shauna was in that class. <laughs> Say it with me. Juan that April with his shorter sota, the drucht of March had passed to the rota, and bothered every vein in switch the core, of which we two engendered it, what's the core? I never thought I would need to know that for Pete's sake. <laughs> but here I am, <coughs> writing a guidebook about Canterbury, and there are those words, and I was able to put those words into this best-selling guidebook. Next year, 20,000 people are gonna read those words. They'll have a better understanding of Chaucer, but they'll also have an understanding of Middle English and how it's so different, and we think English is this static thing, but it's changing all the time. All these lessons you learn at Ohio Wesleyan can come across in really surprising ways. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it's like to do guide, I've been giving you examples of research, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to, to do guidebook research. This is really what I do three or four months a year is when I'm traveling. Um, and the first thing I wanna do is dispel a myth. And I'm never gonna get any sympathy from anybody for the work that I do. But guidebook research is really tiring, difficult, challenging, hard work. People think guidebook researchers are sitting at an outdoor cafe, <laughs> sipping a cappuccino, taking a few notes, watching the world go by, sipping a cappuccino. I never get to do this. I'm trying to slam a Starbucks latte on my way between hotels. I spend most of my time not doing that. I go to grubby train stations and try to make sense of Hungarian train schedules. I spend all of my time trying to find obscure little addresses in back streets in Sicily, having no idea where I'm going, because I've got a list of 20 hotels that I have to update. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what the reality is. It's a fantastic job. I love my job, but it's very hard work. It's very long days. I have to be very organized. I walk around all day, I check my steps sometimes. I'd say when I'm doing research, I average 15 to 20,000 steps a day on a good day, <clears throat> on a slow day. Um, so what I have to do though, honestly, if you see uh, something in a guidebook, somebody has to personally update all of that stuff and we pride ourselves on doing as much as possible in person. So I'll go through my guidebook and I'll make little boxes next to everything I have to check and then I'll just go through town, get organized, do it in order, go into each place, ask a bunch of questions, make the changes, go to the next place, and then I have a little notebook uh, because I often can't fit in the margins of the book and I'm always taking pages and pages of notes. Um, it's just, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of just asking strangers questions. You have to ask a million people a million questions all day long, tourist information, museums, train station information, and you never know what you're gonna get. Sometimes the person at the front of that line is really friendly and they're gonna take pity on you and totally get what you're doing and wanna help you and sometimes they're having a really bad day and they're gonna take it out on you and you just don't know. 
And it's the same with uh, language. You don't necessarily know if they're going to speak English. Um, and that's where my modern foreign language training at Ohio Wesleyan, I use it every single day when I'm in Europe. I use my German and my Spanish all the time. Did you know that in Eastern Europe, the second most valuable second language after English is German? And among older generations, it's the most useful foreign language. I've had so many conversations in German with Croatian innkeepers and people in Hungarian bus stations and restaurants in Poland. Uh, it's an extremely valuable language that can be used in a lot of, a lot of different places. Um, on the other hand, I really love my job, and for the most part, I get to meet a lot of friendly people, even if it is a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility, too, because Europe, as you probably know, is extremely crowded these days. That's sort of the big theme recently. And any time there's a big line in Europe, it's my job to figure out how to help people avoid that line. And there's almost always a way to avoid the line, but you have to do your homework and talk to a million people to figure out what it is. That's something we really pride ourselves on. We want our readers to have the information they need to have a good experience. I also am constantly having to make value judgments, make decisions about which are the, really the best restaurants in this town. You know, this restaurant used to be great, but it's going downhill. Our readers count on us to distinguish between restaurants that are really great and restaurants that are, you know, okay. <laughs> and then, at the end of that day, I go home and I sit at my computer, often for hours, typing up all of those notes, squinting at what I wrote a few hours before. I do have some time back in the office to finish up, but very often um, I want to get it all out on paper while it's still fresh in my mind. And then I hand it over to our guidebook uh, editorial and map making staff. And here again, you're going to be collaborating. If you are lucky to have a great job, you're going to be collaborating with great people. Don't think you can do it all by yourself. Um, I'm really fortunate to work with an amazing staff of people. I can turn over guidebooks to them and never have to worry. I know they're going to handle it just perfectly. Um, before we leave the guidebook research topic, just join me on a fun little journey of sort of a day in the life of a guidebook research, if you'll bear with me. This is a little vicarious travel. Uh, and I'm going to talk about an actual day that I spent this year, I think it was around April, traveling in Tuscany, specifically the Val d'Orcia. The Val d'Orcia is my favorite little stretch of uh, Tuscany. It's a little strip of stunning scenery between the hill towns of Montepulciano and Montalcino, about an hour south of, uh, south of Siena. It's just a stunning, stunning corner of Tuscany. Um, I woke up in a beautiful countryside hotel. One of our favorite hoteliers who runs an agriturismo has just opened a nice new hotel, and somebody has to try it out, right? So I was, that was a good, a good start to that day. And then I hopped in my car, and I had a long list of things I had to do, specifically when I was in Tuscany in this part of the region a few years ago, I'd written a self-guided driving tour designed to help tourists connect the most interesting towns and the most beautiful viewpoints and we don't just assume, once we've written it, that it's going to be the same. We actually go through and drive it again, check all the turns. Is the parking lot still open? Or now do you have to pay a large fee to park there? Did they paint the blue house red so we can't say turn left at the blue house anymore? These are all things you have to think about. Along the way, I have to stop in at lots of little countryside hotels and restaurants. Again, at each one, I'm going to have a conversation, check out some rooms, you know, make sure that their details are still correct for next year. Every single one of them wants me to stay, have a glass of wine, let me feed you lunch. But I got 10 places to go to, so I, I, I get away as quickly as is polite. And then often I have to stop into a town and uh, spend an hour or two running around that town, checking everything in that town. It could be five hotels, five restaurants, a couple of museums, and I've got two or three hours to touch base with each one and make sure that it's all current. On this day, I happened to go to one of my favorite towns in Italy, Montepulciano, a beautiful hill town, and these are the towns that really make that hard work worthwhile. And what I love about Montepulciano is it's packed with really interesting, fun characters that kind of represent what I love about my work. For example, just a few steps downhill from the main square is Adamo. He works at a winery called uh, Contucci Cantina. He's been there forever, and he is evangelical about the wine. He makes vino, uh, uh, vino nobile di Montepulciano, one of the most esteemed Tuscan wines. Uh, and he gets so excited talking about it, he doesn't even notice that you don't speak Italian. He just keeps <laughs> chattering and chattering, and you just nod and smile, and suddenly you realize, I do understand what he's saying, actually. Uh, he's just such a wonderful character who has such a passion for what he does. The last time I went to Monte Polciano, I stopped in to say hello to Adamo. He said, hey, Cameron, how are you? I said, great, how are you? He said, oh, I'm so great. I retired last year, and they still let me come to work every day. <laughs> Just down the street from him is Cesare. Cesare is a coppersmith. He has spent his whole life making copper artwork on literally old roadrunner style anvils with antique stencils. 
He actually has a piece that he uh, gave to the Vatican that's on display in the Vatican. This is his life's work. But these days, his favorite thing is we've got him mentioned in our Rick Steves guidebook. And all day long, he's got Americans who come in and are curious to learn about uh, what he does. And Cesare is at a point in his life where that's the most rewarding thing he can do to share his life's passion with people. And so all day long, he talks to people in Italian about his work. And he taps out little custom, uh, custom engraved copper decorations for them to take home. Uh, this is something that's really a big part of what we do. We're all about connecting American travelers with Europeans who are passionate about what they do. It's really a rewarding thing. We kind of, if we're doing our job, we can get out of the equation. It's all about making those connections for people. Just down the street from Cesare is my favorite steakhouse in Tuscany, if not the world. Uh, it's called Aquaqueta. Um, and this is just a fantastic place. You walk in the door of this restaurant and you know that you're gonna have a great meal. The first course, this is just the first course of some of the best pastas you've ever had, pillowy gnocchi and the local thick peachy noodles with ragu sauce. And then up a couple of steps in the back of the restaurant at this big butcher block is a guy named Julio who has a pencil stuck in his gray ponytail and he's hacking off gigantic slabs of beef. Once you've eaten your pasta, Julio comes down and he scrawls on your tablecloth with a pencil, your paper tablecloth with a pencil. All right, I'll get you a steak. It's gonna be 1.2 kilograms. And you think, how can I possibly eat 1.2 kilograms? But he's not offering you other options. So you say, yeah, okay. So Julio goes up and he hacks off this giant slab of beef and he brings it back to your table and he says, is that okay? What are you supposed to say? And Julio doesn't ask you how you want it done. Julio knows how it's done. This is top quality Chianina beef from Tuscan cows. Eight minutes on one side, eight minutes on the other, coarse salt. And it's done. If you don't like it rare, go to another restaurant. <laughs> so this giant chunk of meat hits your table and you think, there's no way I'm gonna be able to eat this meat. And then you start eating at it and it's the most delicious steak you've had. And somehow, by the end of the meal, <laughs> you've managed to do it. <clears throat> uh, I did not eat at uh, Julio's Steakhouse on this trip because I was too busy. But on my way out of town, I was thinking, I really wish I knew a really good gelato place. There's not a good gelato place in this town. And as I was thinking that, I heard a guy say, hey, come back. And I looked back, and I went and realized that Nicola, who runs my favorite gelato shop two towns over, just opened a new gelato joint on the main drag in Montepulciano. So he invites me in, and he tells me all about his passion for gelato. He makes only gelato with fresh local ingredients. He says, when I opened my shop, all of my Italian customers would come in, and they would say, I feel like having a lampone today. You, do you have this flavor? And he said, I had to train them. You don't come and tell me which flavor you want. You come and ask which flavor I made today, and then you eat it. Um, it's, it's really amazing. Uh, he makes a batch every morning, and then as soon as it sells out, it's finished. That's it. Um, it's really an inspiration connecting with people who take such pride in their craft like this. Um, and then my favorite little kind of epilogue to this story is, uh, I was licking my ice cream cone on the way back to car, and I, and I had this beautiful moment where I overheard people speaking my words, and I looked over, and here's a couple of our Rick Steves readers reading out loud a tour I'd written a few years ago to each other. <laughs> Not a lot of people have that kind of a rewarding experience from their work, and I really, uh, really am lucky that I get to do that. Most of what I've talked about is guidebook research, but the great thing about Rick Steves is that we have lots of other uh, avenues for doing our writing. And about five years ago, I wanted an outlet for a more creative writing, um, write about things that don't really fit in a guidebook. So I started a blog, and it's turned out to be quite successful. Uh, I've posted about 250 posts over the years, and it's, it's achieved sort of a following among Rick Steves fans. And I was very honored earlier this year, uh, the, the article I wrote about Chernobyl, which I mentioned at the start of the talk, was selected for the Best American Travel Writing 2019 collection. Um, so that was really a great honor. Um, that's pretty much it for the main part of my job, writing guidebooks. But I couldn't resist talking about another fun, smaller part of my job that I think people find really interesting, and that's making television. Again, when I was working at, here at Ohio Wesleyan, uh, and when I started working at Rick Steves, I never thought I'd be a guy, uh, uh, somebody writing TV scripts and being a field producer for a TV show. Um, but from time to time, uh, Rick decides he wants some help in an area he doesn't know so well, and I get to actually participate in that process. As I mentioned, Rick's show is a public television show. It airs nationwide. Uh, he's had about 120 episodes altogether, plus another uh, dozen or so full-hour specials. Uh, and I got to tell you, it's a fascinating experience being a fly in the wall on TV production in Europe. Uh, anyone who knows anything about television production 
absolutely cannot believe what I'm about to tell you, but all of these broadcast quality TV shows that you see on public television is made by a crew of three people. Rick is the writer and the host, of course. This is Simon Griffith. He's an amazing guy from New Zealand, the easiest person to get along with you've ever met. Um, he's the producer and the director, and he sets up all the permissions. And then Carl in the middle is one of a couple of camera people that we use. Um, but the amazing thing about this crew is everyone chips in to make sure that they can be as efficient as possible. Simon, in addition to being the producer, carries the gear. In a lot of crews, you would hire a gaffer or a production assistant to pick up all the heavy crates of equipment and walk. Simon will literally go with Carl and set up a shot, and when it's done filming, he'll pick up a 30-pound tripod and sling it over his shoulder, and he's wearing a backpack with a bunch of lighting equipment, and he'll just march to the next stop. And Carl, for his part, is the camera person. He's also the sound guy. He make, mics up Rick, and he mics up anyone Rick is talking to, and he's listening at the same time that he's shooting to make sure it all works. Uh, so it's an incredible machine for producing television. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, Rick writes most of the shows himself. Um, he's involved me over the years in a lot of his scripts. From time to time, he'll just want another set of eyes on something he's written. But then sometimes there's destinations that he doesn't personally know as much about, and he's not as comfortable writing about them and doesn't quite have the time to do it justice. So, for example, a couple of years ago, he sent me to Bulgaria and Romania to scout and write scripts for a couple of shows, uh, and then I went back with the crew to field produce them. And that was a really fascinating experience, traveling to some of these beautiful places that are very unfamiliar to Americans, um, trying to decide which sites do we want to include and what should we say about them. Also making connections with people, because a big part of our show, a big part of everything that we do is making people-to-people -people connections uh, and finding the right kinds of people. We don't necessarily want to present a polished, cliche version of Europe. We want to find people who are carrying on traditional lifestyles, but in a modern context. For example, we stopped in on this person uh, who's lives in a very, very traditional uh, community in Maramures, which is in the northern fringe of Romania. Um, and she's a weaver, and it was really interesting to see a traditional weaving operation. We came and we sort of set up what we were going to do, and we said, okay, we're going to film. She said, well, just a minute. And then she disappeared and came back, and she was wearing this beautiful, perfectly starched white folk costume. And it was a little awkward, but we said, you know, would you mind going and putting on what you were wearing before? Because we really want to show a real side of Europe. We don't necessarily want to show the dressed up side. And I think it's really cool working for a show that, that does that. Uh, we really got into the muck on this one. We went to a traditional farming settlement near where the place I just mentioned was. We watched them milking their goats, and then we watched these guys hand form cheese before our eyes and sat down and, and shared the cheese with them. Uh, some really vivid experiences. Uh, after I did all of this scouting, Rick came over with the crew, and then we set about to filming. We like to use local sidekicks. If you ever notice watching the show, Rick often has a local co-host we just want to get some European voices in the mix. That's important to us. Um, really, when you're filming a TV show, by the way, it takes six days to film a 30-minute TV show, is the general equation. And you would think, how could you possibly need that much time? Um, but you're flexing with the weather. You're flexing with strange things that happen. Um, <clears throat> things that you thought were set up aren't necessarily set up. But you're just scrambling around to what we call cover the script. Cover the script means anything that's mentioned in the script, you have to be sure you filmed. Uh, things our editor back home will need visuals to help drive home whatever points you're making in the script. Um, so really, we're just kind of get out of our way. The sun's going down. We've got three things we need to do today to cover the script. Uh, it's a really fun, intense process, uh, and it comes out with great shows. I couldn't resist telling one of my favorite stories from filming, which I think also illustrates how fun it is when things go wrong. Um, this was in uh, Romania, the capital of Romania, Bucharest. Uh, this is the uh, Palace of the Parliament but it was actually built as the palace of the president back when Nicolae Ceausescu was the president during the communist period of Romania. Um, he was a really brutal dictator, and he basically bankrupted the country for a lot of his projects, but specifically to build this palace. People were literally rationing food, and starving, in some cases virtually starving to death. Electricity was being shut off. All of these resources were being rationed, and at the same time, he was building this incredibly opulent palace for himself. By some measures, it's one of the biggest buildings in all of Europe. So when we were filming this show, we said, you know, we have to film this. This helps tell that story about Nikolai Ceausescu and what it was like under communism. Uh, months before we got there, the tourist board assured us, like we said, this is very important. They assured us, no problem. We're going to get the permissions. Every time I checked in with them, we're working on it. We're going to get it. The night before we were going to film here, we were at dinner with the director of the tourist board. And she said, you know, I got some bad news. We're not going to be able to film at the Palace of the Parliament. And we were kind of in disbelief. She said, well, you know what? Let's try. Let's, well, you know, there's some bureaucracy that got in the way, but let's try. Let's show up in the morning and see what happens. So we showed up in the morning to see what happens. We were told, well, you can't get official permission 
But you can maybe send in Carl, the cameraman, with a little tourist DSLR, and maybe you can sneak enough shots that you can make it work in the show. And we said, well, if that's the only thing we can do, that's what we're going to do. So we all sat outside frustrated on a bench while Carl went in on the tour. And about 20 minutes later, Carl walked out the door. He said, they kicked me off the tour. They were on to me. All right, so I guess we're not going to cover this amazing site. Let's go do some other things. So we went across town, and we were filming some other segments for the show. Suddenly, my phone rang, and it was our contact. And he said, believe it or not, we just got you permission. Come back, and you can film. And we said, we're not going to fall for that again. We're not driving all the way back across town. He said, no, seriously, pull up. You can use the parliamentarian's entrance. Somehow, something just happened, and now we have permission. We literally got a red carpet greeting and VIP hosts, and they let us film anything we wanted in the entire Palace of Parliament. Uh, that's just, a, and my colleagues assured me that's a really extreme example of what can happen when you film TV, but it was very memorable. It also uh, gives me a chance to mention one of my other kind of travel philosophies or tra travel mantras, which is sometimes the things that you remember the best are the things that go wrong. In fact, almost always when someone tells you about the trip, the first thing they tell you about is the thing that went wrong. Um, and one thing I think about a lot is, this is part of my, my wife's family lore, my wife's great-great Aunt Mildred was a great world traveler. She traveled all over the world 100 years ago. And at the end of her life, she wrote a travel memoir, and the title she gave it was Jams Are Fun. <laughs> After seeing so much of the world, the lesson that she took away was, the most fun happens when things go wrong. And I always try to remember my, remind myself of that when I'm in one of these situations, often through gritted teeth. Remember, Cameron, jams are fun. <laughs> uh, but it is really true. When you look back on a trip, that's the stuff that works, uh, that, that, that you remember the best. The last thing I'll say about TV is I was really proud in our Romania show. It was important for me that I wanted to talk about the Roma culture of Romania. Um, Romas are sometimes called gypsies. Um, and this is actually uh, the largest population of Roma in Europe are in Romania. And I think a lot of travel shows uh, would either not want to mention this because it's a little bit uh, complicated and, and the Romanian even government is a little uncomfortable about it. Or they might just show a few shanty towns from a distance and sort of quickly mention it. But I thought it was really important to talk about this as a facet of being in Romania. And so we use local contacts to get in touch with a local family from the Roma community who invited us into their home and they showed us how they do their traditional copper making. This was the, the skill that had been passed down over generations. And uh, I really love this. We actually got to interview, this guy speaks a little bit of English here in the middle. And we actually got to hear him in his own words talk about what it's like to be a Roma person living in Romania. I think it's amazing working for a company that uh, agreed with me that that was a really important thing to do, that we want to introduce Americans to all facets of traveling in Europe. Um, I'm going to finish up just by talking a little bit about my office. This will be very quick. Um, <clears throat> Because I spend about three, three or four months a year traveling in Europe, but that means I spend two-thirds of my life at a desk in Edmonds, Washington. In fact, this is my uh, office right here, and this is Rick's office. There used to actually be a window between our offices, so Rick could literally just slide open a window and throw something on my desk for me to work with. But then I very diplomatically explained, in the interest of confidentiality, it might be better to have a real wall between our desks. And he agreed, so now it's a little bit quieter. And, uh, he has to shout in from the other room for me to come and help him on something. Uh, it's a really great place to work, and it has been ever since I started. 20 years ago when I started, we had about 40 or 45 people in the office, um, and today it's about 110 people. Uh, and when a company grows like that, uh, there's a lot of growing pains, but I gotta say, everyone uh, that I work with are great travelers, they're wonderful people. Uh, they all have the same positive attitude, and we really share the same philosophy about travel. But you do have to be really careful and make sure <clears throat> that you don't lose sight of your roots when you're growing this fast. Uh, and uh, five years ago, uh, I stopped being just a guidebook editor and I was basically put in charge alongside Rick with overseeing the content at our company. So Rick and I worked together very closely to make sure that our content is on track and staying true to our vision. And I had a really fun uh, event earlier this year where I gathered a bunch of our new hires who had just started and who were doing a lot of writing in Rick's voice uh, with a lot of people who've been working with us for 10 or 15 or 20 years, and we all sat around a table and brainstormed what are the characteristics of the Rick Steves company voice. Uh, and it was just a wonderful uh, chance to sort of take stock of all the great people I get to work with. What was really interesting is all of us who work with Rick Steves agreed 100%. There was no disagreement. Anytime someone said, well, what about this? Everyone said, oh, of course that's right. Uh, and it was fun to actually uh, come up with a list of characteristics of the Rick Steves voice. Again, I started thinking about Dr. Musser and the whole English department here at Ohio Westland. 
um, and how I learned how important a written voice is and what it means. And what's really interesting is we talk about voice, but a lot of companies call this brand. People would call this a brand Bible. I never thought I would be in a position of managing a brand, um, but when you work really hard and distinguish yourself and prove that you're in sync with a company and you find a place where you match their values, uh, it's kind of the sky's the limit in terms of that sort of thing. And there's a lot of fun projects we're working on too. This one is semi-secret. Um, but we're a couple of years into working on an app uh, that I'm working with a brilliant uh, developer on our staff that's going to combine the information from our guidebooks with our video clips, with our radio show, with our audio tours, so people can access all of the Rick Steves content in one place on their phones uh, when they're traveling in Europe. That'll be out in the next year or two, so stay tuned for that. It's not quite ready for prime time. We're testing it right now. Another thing I'm really proud of about Rick Steves is we have a really strong conscience. We're a company, we know what our values are in terms of travel, but part of our travel values has to do with being good global citizens. Uh, and Rick does a tremendous amount of philanthropy on all sorts of different causes. And just earlier this year, he decided he's going to voluntarily donate a million dollars every year to help offset the carbon footprint of 30,000 people who fly back and forth to Europe on our tours every year. And because Rick is a really unconventional guy, he said, I'm not just going to buy offsets for planting trees. I want to do it in a creative way. Um, so he's mostly funding cr uh, climate smart projects in the developing world, uh, which is where the climate, the impact of climate change is, is most impactful. Um, so I'm really proud to work for a company that really puts its money where its mouth is in this regard. And somewhat related to that, uh, he's also been working this year on a new one hour public television special, trying to understand the causes of global poverty and global hunger and some possible solutions. It's called Rick Steves' Hunger and Hope. He filmed earlier this year in Ethiopia and Guatemala. That'll be out in February, which is uh, really exciting. And another, another uh, aspect of people would look at this and say, well, that's not Europe. Why are you getting involved in things in the developing world? But it all has to do with we are travelers and we have a strong conscience and we want to be good global citizens. And it's really, it's really exciting working for a company. You know, we, we hear a lot these days about values-driven companies and it's interesting because my company has been values driven all along before anyone ever called it that. And I remember when I first started at Rick Steves and I came home and saw friends and I said, you know, it's the strangest thing. It's a for-profit company, but we have an, a non-profit mentality. Everyone's always talking about our message and about teaching travel. They're not talking about making money and selling more tours and selling more guidebooks. That's mission driven. That's values driven. And it's really exciting to work for a company like that. And another great thing about being at a values-driven company is there's great work-life balance. That's one of our values. We really value the power of travel and we make sure that people have the ability to travel. Uh, the first question you're all gonna ask after this is does your wife ever get to go to Europe with you? And the answer is yes, she gets to go a lot. She has uh, also, uh, by the way, Shauna was an English and a vocal performance major here at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, and she has a very, uh, her own career as a human resources director and a leadership coach, uh, but she gets a lot of vacation from her company. And so she very often comes over and either hangs out with me and uh, travels with me while I'm doing work. And then while I'm late at night typing on the computer, she falls asleep. Uh, or we take time off and go on vacation. We were just in Provence in the south of France for about a week at the end of October using the Rick Steves guidebook, of course. Uh, and don't undersell that. If you're looking at companies, looking at uh, where you want to work, uh, finding a company that not only reflects your values, but lets you have a work-life balance and lets you follow your interests is, is really critical. Just to sum things up, I thought about um, if I were a student in the audience right now and I was thinking, Jesus, this, this guy has this crazy job that involves writing guidebooks and working on TV. Um, what am I supposed to take away from this? I just wanted to sum up a few points that I would, that I would drive home. A liberal arts education isn't necessarily about getting you a job. Rick Steves didn't see Ohio Wesleyan University on my resume and say, I got to get this guy on my team. Um, it's to get a job, you might have to have some persistence, some hard work, and in my case, have a little bit of luck. However, once you have your job, your Ohio Wesleyan degree prepares you to excel at whatever you wind up doing. Without even realizing it, you are learning invaluable skills that you're going to apply in a hundred ways you don't even realize yet. Critical thinking, communication, flexibility, being interdisciplinary, being able to switch from zoology to writing to whatever you want. That's what you learn from Ohio Wesleyan. It sets you up to succeed. Uh, again, to repeat what I mentioned earlier, a career is like a trip to Europe. You want to have a framework, but you should remain flexible. Um, it's really scary entering the workforce and you might think this is my plan A, this is what I really want to do. 
I had no idea what I was going to do and it all worked out and I was ready to flex with opportunities when they presented themselves. So for me at least, that was a good plan. Follow your passion. First of all, figure out what your passion is. Follow it and find an organization that matches your values and your priorities. As I said, when I took a job to sell backpacks in a little town near Seattle, I think some of my friends thought I was crazy. But I recognized this is a company that does something I'm passionate about. And it's a company that seems to have the values that I have. And I'm willing to take a chance and pay my dues and maybe it'll turn into something worthwhile. And boy, did it ever. Once you're at that company that matches your values and your passions, carve out your own niche. Work hard, take initiative, distinguish yourself. I had to kind of volunteer for anything and everything to make sure people knew I was serious about contributing. And fortunately, there was a great big niche for me in the Eastern Europe department that was available to me, and I filled it as, as quickly as I could. And when I did that, it was frightening. It was a big challenge to take on in 2003, five years out of college, to write a 600-page guidebook about Eastern Europe. But I took it one day at a time. I went to that first hotel on that first day, and then the next hotel, and then the next museum, and I ended up doing it. You tackle those big challenges the way you would eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Uh, this is something I've really learned and taken to heart working with some amazing people in Edmonds, Washington. Play to your strengths, but you want to collaborate with smart people who play to their strengths. Don't feel like you have to do everything yourself. Don't feel like it's all on you. Find people you like working with. Find people who energize you. Collaborate with them, and the results will be well worth it. And the last word I would say is, it's easy for me to say, but relax. It's scary graduating. It's scary not knowing what's going to happen. Just go with the flow, try to come up with a plan, do what you can to get your foot in the door, but celebrate those serendipities. Don't be so wedded to an idea of what you want that you pass up something that might be even better that presents itself. And always remember, if things go wrong, jams are fun. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much for your kind attention. I'm really honored you all came out, and happy travels. And I think... We're going to do a Q and A. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. If you have any uh, questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. And I can also chat with anyone after the talk as well. Yeah. Okay. Had to make sure this was on. Also, do feel free to go ahead and leave if you have somewhere else to be and have to get to other class and practices. Um, so I was wondering. You already mentioned a little bit about like what your company is trying to do to counteract the carbon footprint of tourism, but rather than like trying to patch up the problem by donating money, do you ever try and recommend like environmentally friendly options? Like you recommended that you do cheaper or like more maybe for the richer people or cheaper options, you know, do you ever look for maybe in transportation like those options? <clears throat> That's a great question. We really wrestled with this because for years Rick has really wanted to address the carbon footprint of travel because travel creates a big carbon footprint. He and I, and we all believe that the answer is not, we, we believe the answer is not simply not to travel. We want to travel, but you have to be responsible um, and figure out a way to offset the damage that you're doing. We looked at a lot of different options, and we spent, Rick, I'd say, spent a couple of years with our COO who helped pioneer this program, looking at all the different choices. And what we came away with was there's a million ways that you can address this problem, and we wanted to find one that suited our values and suited our interests and our approach. So that would have been one approach that we could have used, um, but we decided, um, again, kind of looking in a big picture sense at the idea that the developing world has a huge impact of climate change. And changes that you make in the developing world in terms of stopping deforestation, teaching people more environmentally friendly methods for cooking, for example. One example is a lot of people in the developing world have open stoves, which uses a lot more fuel. It's very difficult on people who have to tend the fire. It's bad for the environment. It creates more smoke. Replacing those with smart stoves that are more efficient. Um, not only does it Im uh, affect, so you're, you're kind of, attacking climate change at one of the places where it starts, but you're also putting money into a community that's affected by climate change, if that makes sense. Um, so there's nothing wrong with the other approaches. Uh, we have gotten a, a little bit of heat. We've had people who sell carbon offsets by planting trees who've been a little bit kind of miffed, saying, why don't you just plant some trees? And I think that's great for some people, but this, Rick is a very unconventional thinker, and he likes to think outside the box, and he likes to follow his conscience, and this was, this was an area that he felt like would be a creative way to do it. Other questions? Yep. <clears throat> Hi.
Hi, um, my question isn't necessarily about your career path. Um, mine is more focused on your hobbies. Mm -hmm. You shoot a lot of photos. I was curious what camera you shoot on or what lenses you prefer, where you started. I'm just more curious about that. I kind of um, stumbled into the photography. I didn't take any at Wesleyan, but I, um, when digital cameras were a new thing in the early 2000s, I bought a camera and then I got a few years later a slightly better camera. And I think when you're, I, I've always kind of enjoyed photography and then when I find myself in beautiful places, it's very satisfying to have the right camera to capture it. Um, for a while I was traveling with a little point and shoot and you can't quite capture this kind of detail with a little point and shoot. So I've gradually over the years stepped up and what I've been using the last few years is a Nikon, I think D750, and I travel with two lenses. One of them is a Tamron and I, I think it's a 15 to 30, uh, which is a fisheye kind of lens. And then the other one is a more conventional, I think it's a Nikon made zoom lens. Um, my camera bag is really heavy. Anytime I hand it to my wife, she's just like, I don't know how you do this. And I'm, I gotta say, it, 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 you know, every night when I have a sore back, I think, why do I carry this camera around? But I feel like when I see the results, I say, oh yeah, that's, that's why I carry the camera around. But yeah, it's something I'm pretty self-taught. I took a, a brief photography course in, in Seattle 12 years ago, and I got a little bit out of that, but it's just trial and error. For every beautiful picture I've taken, I've taken literally a thousand terrible pictures. <laughs> yep. Back here. Hi, so I realized that um, a lot of your presentation and a lot of your company focuses in, your, in European travel, um, but I couldn't help but notice that the only representation that you had for non-European countries and Ethiopia and Guatemala um, was that of impoverished, and um, I was wondering if you would ever um, want to expand your company towards um, other countries to show the um, non-impoverished side mm -hmm. of these um, countries that are not in Europe? That's a great question, very good question. Um, first of all, we just the first part of the question, we specialize in Europe because, and, I, and this is a hard sell for, for even people who work here sometimes, uh, we want to do one thing and do it really well. And, and Rick started this company writing and traveling in Europe. He's grown it that way. Those of us who've come along for the ride, we've, we've realized if you do one thing and you do it really well, um, you're, you really have an edge. And there have been points where we could have like said, let's branch out and write a bunch of guidebooks and slap the Rick Steve's name on them. But we knew that the quality wouldn't be the same. Um, so I, I think that that's the reason why we focus on Europe. An example of a place where we do try to get onto the edges of Europe to show different sides of the human experience is Turkey. Turkey has always been a big part of our uh, company's program. And of course, if you, if you know the geography of Turkey, there's a little piece of Turkey that's technically in Europe. So as a, on a technicality, we've always included it as a part of our program. And that's something that Rick's been passionate about going back 30 years when he was a backpacker himself. I think he found it fascinating to go to a Muslim country um, that's not European. And it really challenged some of his preconceptions. Um, and it really challenged, uh, it really broadened his perspectives. Um, and so that's something he's been really pushing his whole career. We have uh, guided tours in Turkey. We have an Istanbul guidebook. Um, so I would say that's an example of, it's a tricky balancing act because we want to stay focused on Europe, but you're right, you want to show other aspects of things. And I think Turkey has is, is been the thing to this point that's, that's filled that slot for us. Yep. Have you noticed uh, a change in perception among Europeans due to the, I'll just say the ridiculousness of our political climate here? And how are Europeans interacting with Americans? And, and is there, have, have you noticed a change? The answer is no. And that was the same no matter who's the president, no matter what's going on. Um, Europeans are very smart and very savvy, and they've been through a lot worse than we have. Regardless of what your politics are, there's been a lot of changes in Europe. Um, I think Europeans probably have a more sophisticated understanding than a lot of Americans do, that you can't hold an individual responsible necessarily um, for the behavior of an elected official whatever that official's political stripes are. Um, and so we get this, we've got this question a lot uh, during the Bush years, during the Gulf War, and so forth. And I will say from my experience on the ground interacting with Europeans all day, every day, no one treats me differently depending on who the president is. Um, and I think that's something I really love about traveling and I really love about Europe. I do think if you go in with your hackles up and you have an agenda and you try to push it on Europeans and you don't want to listen to their perspectives, you're not going to be received as warmly probably. Um, but I think, you know, if you're willing to just go along for the ride and absorb what you have there, um, I've, never, I've never felt 
even in, during the Gulf War, even during times when the US's brand abroad was really tarnished, I always felt very much welcomed with open arms as an American. So I actually have a question. Yeah. It's tied to some of what we talked about with the students at dinner. How has the internet changed your job? Oh, dramatically. Yeah, um, when I was first doing research, we did have uh, internet, but I, you didn't have smartphones. So I would, um, you know, I had to look something up online. You'd have to either go to an internet cafe or go to your hotel and pay a lot of money to dial up. Actually dial up. I used to have a phone cord I would stick into my, into my computer. Um, it's made things a lot easier. One of my favorite tools for guidebook research is Google Earth, or Google Maps, where you can get the street view. Um, so if I'm, you know, writing a driving tour, and I forget exactly what the turn was or how it was signposted. Anywhere almost in Europe, you can drop a point and see the view that you would see from that road. Um, so that's made a huge difference. Um, I would also say um, guidebooks, you probably, some of you are probably thinking guidebooks are pretty old fashioned. Guidebooks are kind of dinosaurs. And I think the other big change, of course, is the way people get their travel information has migrated online. A lot of these crowdsourced review sites like TripAdvisor um, are extremely influential. I would say Rick's guidebooks used to be kind of the gold standard for travel information and were highly influential and that's been eclipsed now. Uh, when I go to places that have been the guidebook for years, they say, I remember when your guidebook was what everyone used and now everyone's using TripAdvisor. Uh, we find, in, in fact, our guidebook sales are continuing to increase, although the whole pie is shrinking. We have a bigger piece of the pie, but the pie of travel guidebooks is shrinking. Um, but I'm always surprised how many people still do use paper guidebooks, people of all ages, um, because you have, it's a different kind of information. I do check TripAdvisor or Booking.com just to get a second opinion or a consensus about whether a hotel or a restaurant is good. Uh, a guidebook is not that. It's not crowdsourced. It's expert curated. It's somebody who's actually spent the time going to 20 restaurants in that town so they can make real, rooted in fact and, and personal experience, judge, value judgments about how they're different. Um, so I, we see them as being very complementary. Um, it's funny, we're not really threatened by, by the rise of that stuff because, and again, we're working on an app and a lot of our material is available online and, you know, we're always going to produce good travel content. The challenge is sort of how to get it out there. Is that fair? Yeah. Yep. Do you have a favorite travel writer or a favorite travel movie? Ha! My favorite uh, travel writer is Gene Openshaw. Um, my second favorite is Rick Steves. <laughs> and my... Third favorite is uh, Bill Bryson. I really like Bill Bryson's writings. I think he's really, he's not doing as much travel writing these days, but I really love when my wife and I went to Australia. Um, this spring, we listened to uh, Bill Bryson's book about Australia as a, a recorded ebook, or audio book, and it was really fun. Um, so those are probably the ones I like the best. I find uh, New York Times has, by the way, just for, in terms of travel writing for finding restaurants or at nightlife or, or capturing a place, I think New York Times does great travel writing. I think The Guardian, a London-based newspaper does great travel writing. Travel movies, I have so many. I'm a, a huge uh, cinephile, so um, off the top of my head, I don't think I have a single favorite. I have, a, I have favorites per country. There are certain movies that I watch, even if I've seen it before, when I come to a country for the first time in a few years, I like to watch that movie to kind of get me in the right spirit. Uh, does your company, or do you, research or recommend those new uh, electronic translators? You know, we don't strongly recommend them, but we do. It's one of many tools that, we, that, we, that, that are worth considering. Um, I use Google Translate quite a bit. That can be, that's a great free app that not only can you um, type in things and translate it, but you can speak into it and it will translate it. And in a lot of languages, you can hold it up to a sign if you have internet ac access and it'll translate it on your screen. Um, I think those things are, are, I love those little gadgets and tools, but uh, you know, these days, uh, and again, we specialize in Europe, and in most of Europe, most people speak English, so I find there's, there's less of a language barrier than, than, than there might have been in the past or than people might expect. Um, but I'm always, I love trying out new gadgets like that. I've used Google Translate several times. Yeah, we have lots of your books, so. Um, we were just in Amsterdam, and now we've, we're, we're reading that it's just being overrun by tourists. I'm wondering if uh, you get feedback from some of these countries and just say, you know, stop writing about us, or <laughs> you know, could you put that on the shelf for a little while, because we need to catch up, so. Yep, it's a fair question and a very important question, and you hear a lot these days about over-tourism, and you really see it when you're in places like Amsterdam is one of the cities, Barcelona, Reykjavik in Iceland, um, 
anywhere in Italy. Um, yeah, it's a fair point. Um, the way I look at it, <clears throat> we know, we recognize that Americans are going to go to Europe anyway. Our job is to teach them how to be good travelers, how to be culturally sensitive, um, how to approach Europe in a way that's respectful and not contributing to the problem. Um, and so I think in some ways we take pride in if they're going to go anyway, we'd like to equip them with that information and, and preach at them a little bit before they go to make sure they're not making it worse. That said, there, is, there are cities like Amsterdam. I think the mayor just came out recently and said we don't want tourists anymore. Um, I think there's, I've also seen over the years there's an ebb and flow to that. Um, I, I've seen cities that have gotten to that point and then Iceland's a good example. Iceland uh, peaked about two years ago. There was a budget airline called, called Wow Airlines that was driving tons of people there. And I was traveling in Iceland at the time and everyone was saying, we don't know what we're gonna do with all these tourists. They're driving us crazy, we can't handle it. I was there again a couple months ago and Wow Airlines in the meantime had gone bust. So Wow Airlines stopped flying. And suddenly a lot of the Icelanders were like, we don't know where all the tourists are. We're really worried about our tourist income is down. And I don't mean to make fun or make light of it, but there is people in places like that are always going to complain about the tourists, but they also rely on them. And I, I guess the other thing I'd say about that is we go to places like the Cinque Terre in Italy, which I mentioned. Actually, that's it there. And Rick was one of the people who put Cinque Terre on the map 20 or 30 years ago. And mass tourism has really changed the Cinque Terre. And one of my challenges when I go there is I want to, again, I want, we, we have to acknowledge the fact that it's crowded. I want to teach our travelers how to travel in a respectful way. When I talk to people in the Cinque Terre on the ground and I say, I hear you're really tired of all these tourists, what they tell me, this is anecdotal, we love Rick Steves tourists. What we're tired of are the cruise ships that come in and dump thousands of people just for the day and they don't spend any money to support our economy and then they come back. They say the Rick Steves travelers have been here all along and they're always going to be here and they help support us. They spend the night here, they eat at restaurants here, you know, they're part of the economy and we find that they're really interested in learning about these places and not just whistle stop tourists. So um, tourism is a problem in a lot of places. We like to think we're the good kind of tourism. Um, I think the mass tourism is what a lot of places are struggling with. That might be a cop out, honestly. It's something that we're doing soul searching about right now. Um, the other thing that we're talking about, I talked about Gdansk in Poland. We're talking more and more about reminding people there are alternatives to the really famous places. Um, that's something that we're inching towards more and more. We've always done a little bit of that, but to say, if Amsterdam is crowded, consider going to Gdansk. It's half as expensive and just as beautiful and uh, a lot less crowded. So that's another approach that we're kind of playing around with. <clears throat> Hi, um, we were in Florence this year and we fell for the uh, 10 euro gelato scam. Oh yeah, that's a classic. <clears throat> and later that day we were looking at our guidebook and we said, oh, right here it would have told us about the 10 euro gelato scam, so. Um, that's how do you that's go exactly what we do. We find out about those scams and try to warn people. How do you go about finding out about them and do you get any pressure to not report on things like that. <clears throat> the thing that's very clear to me and that's always been Rick's imperative and I, do, I tell when I, tr I train a lot of our guidebook researchers and I tell them the same thing. As, a, as guidebook writers we have to be incorruptible and our one and only responsibility is to make sure that the traveler using our book has a good experience. Uh, we don't take uh, kickbacks for, in exchange for listing something. If somebody tells me don't mention that in your guidebook you better believe I'm going to make a note about it and we'll probably mention it in my guidebook. Um, <laughs> I've, we've lost some friends that way, um, but it's something that's really important to us. Um, and how you find out about those, we have a lot of local, I showed a bunch of our Eastern Europe guides. In every town we have people that we know, that we've known for years, that Rick has known for years. Um, and I always make a point to check in with those people and they know what we're about. So they, I'll sit down with some of these people and they'll say, all right, take your pencil out. Here are the three big scams right now. This is a big change that's coming next year. Um, we have to work hard to get the scoop on that stuff. It takes hard work and being there um, that's why a lot of guidebooks um, do more of their updating remotely by email or by letter or by phone. And um, we do that sometimes if we really need to and we're, when we do we're keenly aware that it's not as good and there's something to be said for actually going and talking to people on the ground. And by the way, the 10 euro gelato scam, if you're going to Florence, <clears throat> you go to a gelateria on the main street and you, it says, you know, one euro for a, a, a ball of gelato, a scoop of gelato. And you say, great, I'll have a cone, just give me the, this flavor. And they put six, they first of all use the chocolate encrusted waffle cone and they put six scoops on and they pour chocolate on top and now it's a 12 euro cone. The way to, and this is the other thing, we teach people how to avoid that. The way you avoid that, if you think of places like that, 
I would like a two euro cone of gelato, please. That's all you have to say. They're gonna prey on the easy pickings and if you don't know your, if you don't know that strategy, they're gonna take advantage of you. If you do know the strategy, they're not gonna bother trying to trick you. Any other questions? Okay. Last public question. So you mentioned that you took um, like a backpacking trip through Europe after you graduated. Um, can you sort of speak to the importance of an experience like that for young people in learning to become culturally sensitive and good global citizens? I think you just said it perfectly. Not staged. Seriously. <laughs> it's like you're reading it right off the Rick Steves playbook. No, we really, that's absolutely the case. Um, the more that people can travel when they're young, I think the more they'll realize they're a citizen of the world, they'll realize there's other ways to do things. Not necessarily better or worse, just they realize that the world is bigger than they, they might have thought. Um, Rick has said, I'm not gonna get this quite right, but he said something along the lines of, if the US really knew what was best for its national security, it would require that every college student do a semester abroad. Because I do think it would really foster understanding, make tangible connection, person-to-person -person connections, uh, and again, it's, uh, Rick loves the statistic that the U.S. is 94% of the population, and he talks about what we do is trying to expose Americans to the other 96% of the world's population. Um, only good can come of that. Particularly when you're a big, powerful, monolithic country with, you know, that, that's surrounded on both sides by oceans that's used to getting its way. I think it's really important for us to remember that we're citizens of the world. So, you, you put it perfectly. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all very much.